Welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And here we are, Wes. This is, uh, you know, when we get an opportunity to go back to one of, you know, there's a lot of great people we've talked to. Mm. And the opportunity sometimes comes up to get to go back and actually really dive into something that changed the way we think. And so that's why I'm excited about that today. I'm excited about that today. I think it's going to be a very interesting time. But as we're as we're talking, Wes, I think, you know, this last couple of years, you know, as you guys remember, if you listen to the show, back in COVID times, Wes and I were talking a lot about dentistry and COVID and dentistry and COVID. And I think we didn't really understand what was about to happen in our economy. We didn't really understand what was going to change about the way that maybe not just dentists, but people in general changed their thought process and where they wanted to be. But I do think, Wes, in our area, particularly southeast part of the United States, we've seen some crazy changes, I think. I mean, we've always known that where we are is a beautiful place. Mm and somewhat less expensive to live, maybe a lot less expensive to live than big cities. But we're seeing some craziness happening, I think, with people kind of just looking at where do I want to practice? Where do I want to live? What do I want? And also, too, some of it's driven by what you want, and some of it's driven by what can you afford to do, and where can you afford to live, and what's it mean for you long term? And Wes, I mean, you're in an area, I mean, you've just obviously been in, in a building process, completed a couple of years back. What's going on where you are with that? I mean, what are you seeing in your area, which is a relatively large, you know, not big city, but maybe I would say medium size. Would, is that fair? Yeah. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is like, you know, I saw the other day a statistic just about East Tennessee or actually Tennessee in general and how inflated our prices are for housing. Um, I think mm. we're, we're in the top five, if not the top 10, of how maybe overinflated um, our prices uh, for housing. Uh, East Tennessee has experienced huh. an incredible amount of growth. I don't know if you knew that, but um, that was very interesting to me. And considering our income, median income here is not like – extremely, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not tops, you know, we're mm -hmm, in the South. Mm -hmm. And the good news is, is that the cost of living, um, is still pretty low, um, even with yes. some of these things, but it does make you think. And a lot of, a lot of what happened for East Tennessee is we had a major influx of people that had cash, uh, businesses yeah, that have cash, uh, people that had cash that sold maybe in markets that were, you know, you know, worth a lot more. Maybe they're coming from California or something like that. But we saw a major influx here, which really has affected um, uh, professional conversation uh, regarding what mm. do we do next, even right down to physicians, um, you know, and and you know, how they're even making decisions of, you know, past residency, where am I going to go? I think everybody, um, you know, feels a little bit of the, of the, um, of the push, uh, to, to really move to a city, but then you start thinking about, whoa, the prices have really yeah, skyrocketed. Does it make sense? And, and in our dental world where, you know, whether you're going to associate and just, you know, work, for you know private practice or corporate or whatever it is or whether you are planning to own you got to think about this you got to think about mm. where do i want to be what makes the most sense and what's going to be sustainable for me and my family over the long term it's it's some of it is about what you want and some of it is about just practicality and nuts and bolts and you know gosh Wes, how long ago was it that we recorded an episode on Big city versus small town. It was mm. years ago, probably, I don't know, not 10 years ago, but six or seven years mm -hmm. ago on why you would look to, as a dentist, you know, choose your practice location. And again, there's good and bad about everything, but I do see how it's changing 
the the face of our profession and you know i know obviously interest rates and those things are affecting all of us but man it is it is interesting so i all i would say in terms of like to leave it here is you know if you're if you're in this this world of trying to figure out what comes mm. next you know i think you're probably starting there's a lot of people that maybe thought i would never move from where i grew up or i yeah. would never move away from a city i went to school in or i'd never move and now you're looking at reality and going okay can I, can I actually make this work? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it, it just, just do your due diligence, make sure that you're choosing the right place for you, for your family, for your practice, because man, you can be successful in a lot of places in, in the country, but there's some places where it is easier. I think Wes to, mm. to, to come in and to, and to put down roots. So I, I think it's just interesting. We've been Text talking a lot about guys. this and now it's, yeah, and, and text us your thoughts. Yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, what's messing with you with that? Because it's definitely messing with us. And, you know, while we're talking about, before we get into the, the meat of the show, mm. always we want to thank our sponsors for what they do to help support the Dental Guys. And, you know, both Wes and I have been involved with and have been very, uh, you know, seen a very well-respected implant continuum come along, and that's in restorative driven implants. And, you know, an RDI, you know, started with the idea of a research-based focus and how to uh, how to train general dentists or even specialists in a way, a systematic way, a research-based way to learn how to both place and restore dental implants. And, you know, obviously a lot, this is a hot topic. If you listen to the show, you know, mm -hmm. it's something that a lot of people are talking about. And the question people come up with is, well, where should I go to learn? There are a lot of good places, but there's not a lot of places that are going to give you the real world setup of cases. Uh, there's not a lot of places that spend a lot of time on why we do what we do. There's not a lot of places that provide you with a system based upon science. So if you're interested in adding implants to your uh, armamentarium. If this is something you've been looking at, thinking, "Ah, oh, man, I, at some point I want to learn how to place implants or, you know, be able to, to really understand this in a systematic way, go to restorativedrivenimplants.com or call 715-207-6587. That's 715-207-6587. Tell them the dental guys sent you. Tell them the dental guys sent you. Tell them that we were telling you this is the place to start. We really believe in it. You know, the Dental Guys is also brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, long-term sponsor. Appreciate the guys over at the Dental Crafters Network, guys and gals. Just recently today, finished an amazing, amazing, incredible four-unit anterior, lower anterior bridge with pink porcelain on it. Um, mm. Incredible modern design, eliminating uh, cylinders, going milling straight to MUAs, multi-unit abutments. And what I love about the Dental Crafters Network is that not only do they have the talent to be able to achieve the aesthetics part of these things, they have the knowledge to incorporate new technology and new methods of milling strategies. Um, and um, I really appreciate the Dental Crafters Network and, and what they've done for my patients uh, we've used the Dental Crafters Network long before they were a sponsor. You guys know Brad, the Dental Lab guy. So unlock the potential of one relationship with the Dental Crafters Network where possibilities are truly infinite. Family-owned, full-service dental laboratory. They collaborate with us, dentists, and meet the unique needs of today's ever-changing dental industry. Choose Dental Crafters Network where your vision meets innovation. Please visit the dentalcrafters.net or call 1-800-472-8302 today. Don't forget to mention the Dental Guys, and you'll get 10% right. off, John, your first case. Thank you so much to the Dental Crafters no Network and Restorative Driven Implants for sponsoring the Dental Guys. Can't do it without you guys. Tonight, oh my, one of our favorite people, Michael Norton, all the way from yep. England, this show was recorded previously at the Academy of Awesome Integration. If you weren't there, you missed it. It was incredible. Yep. John, are we really 
are we really seeing something that could be revolutionary tonight on tonight's show? Um, after we get done uh, interviewing Michael Norton, we'll come back on briefly to kind of just discuss some of the things that we uh, heard from him and some conversation stoppers, uh, some real conversation. Absolutely. And that's what, that's what Michael Norton's all about, stirring the pot. And we love uh, Dr. Norton and appreciate him coming on the show. So without further ado, Dr. Michael Norton. Well, welcome to this special episode of the Dental Guys at the Academy of Osseo Integration 2024. I'm Wes, the Dental Guy. And I'm John, the Dental Guy. And, you know, we have uh, we've enjoyed very much getting to speak to some names that we, some of which we've spoken to before, some of which we haven't, and get to really discuss some topics that have been largely focused on one thing, mainly mm. so far, periplantitis. But this is going to be a little... Different conversation. Good evening, Astra. That's right. I, rem I still remember. Good morning. <laughs> good evening. Good morning. We remember. But it's back, evening. Back to the but days. It's the so, yeah, right. but it was morning before. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we'd like to uh, introduce, and for those of you who have been watching the show for a while, probably needs no introduction, but Dr. Michael Norton's here with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you, guys. Pleasure. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. the invitation. We're excited to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah. This has been, uh, we've had some good conversations in the past. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of been the theme of, of our show this, this year, we've kind of had a theme that sort of developed of, you know, we talk a lot about what's messing with us. What are some things that are changing the way we think? And, and we'd like to, to maybe explore that a little bit more open-ended today mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. And we have some very specific things we want to talk about because, you know, reading some articles or some things out there that we think you would be interested in. Mm -hmm. But just so far with this meeting, tell us, some th is there anything messing with you? Have you seen anything interesting, anything changing your mind or making you think about something completely differently? Or is it so, so far things you can, okay, I kind of, these are things I expected. Well, I think there are a lot of things that, one might have expected. I mean, in the opening session, what I thought was a great session on peri-implantitis, you mentioned that that's been a theme for you. Uh, I think we heard some very predictable uh, approaches to that from various quarters. Uh, and, and what's clear is that there's plenty of disagreement. And you know I love disagreement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. um, but uh, no, what it's done for me, I think, is I, I sit in those sessions and I actually challenge my own dogma. And I ask myself, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong. Mm. Uh, I have to say, in that particular session, it only <laughs> reinforced my own dogma. But... Um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it's it's important that we that we have that debate, and if everybody's singing from the same song sheet, then we really don't need a conference, do we? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's important. Well, one of the things that we've we've seen, as we do many times when we come to this meeting, is is companies uh, presenting new designs, mm -hmm. new ideas, mm -hmm. and we've seen some some new design implant designs, for mm -hmm. instance. And you know, there's a we kind of been thinking about, you know, there's there's some companies that have a lot of designs, mm. a lot of different designs. Uh, and even in one company, you might see you know, eight or ten different designs. And yeah. the question we have for you, Michael Norton, is how many, how many designs do we really need? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a leading question. Yeah, it is. Um, well, I, I, I think it's, it, it's clear that, you know, there's a difference between design for innovation and design for design's sake. Uh, and I do think that we are currently in a bit of a rut where the manufacturers, many of the manufacturers are designing for design's sake mm. uh, without actually offering any necessarily innovative technology. And, you know, people ask me often um, about the pace of change of implant design, but... Uh, you know, I placed actually the very f world's first microtextured, microthreaded, platform switched for want of a better term, internal conical implant in a patient in 1992. And if you walk around this exhibition hall, you'll find that most implants today are microtextured, microthreaded, conical interface, platform switch. So what's changed? Um, I suppose maybe thread technology has changed a bit, but I can tell you 
that there is nothing really innovative in any of those thread technologies. They're all the same basic kind of thread. There are some very interesting thread technologies out there, by the way, in the orthopedic sector mm. that haven't come into this uh, field uh, that are entirely different to what we see here today. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, I think, uh, I suppose it's a bit like the car business, isn't it? Every year they've got to come out with a new design. But once in a blue moon, a car manufacturer will do something revolutionary, like introduce an airbag, right? That's right. <coughs> and that is a true revolution. And then eventually every car in the world has an airbag. Well, I like that he brings up the car analogy because in the United States, the Ford F-150 has been the number one selling car slash truck in the war in the united states mm -hmm. more f-150s have been sold since its release years ago in mm -hmm. the 60s and if you look at the design characteristics of that uh, car manufactured it has really not changed except for just some plastics and metals and maybe yeah we've changed the engine per se but it is essentially the same thing mm -hmm. and it seems very daunting for new clinicians to, that are interested in starting to place dental implants because you and mm. I and, and John, we have the knowledge of what 1992 looked like. Correct. Now, it's not the 90s. It's not the 90s. And we could sit in a lecture to this morning and understand why it's not the 90s. And we know some of the things that you and I lucked out on when it comes with that micro-threaded platform switched implant that you've been placing for so many years. We did luck out a little bit, I feel like, by the, the way that that implant was designed. But today, clinicians really that are new, how are they choosing a dental implant to place? It's, it's overwhelming. It's, it's overwhelming. overwhelming. <clears throat> and I'm confused about how to teach this and how to help someone and to help them get past some of the cool factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the big problems, frankly, in that is that if every implant offers variations of the same features then maybe there isn't anything to choose from then you're looking at things like brand recognition service quality do you like the look of your local rep <laughs> right i mean you know, and all, <laughs> i mean that's really sort of what it might boil down to and you know, it's quite interesting. So obviously you've had me on here before talking about talk. I mean, mm -hmm. that test story uh, interview, I think, seems to have been quite a popular uh, yes. uh, subject. And, you know, even I'm starting to get a little bit tired and a little bit bored of the high talk versus low talk debate. It's gone on for so long. And you may or may not be aware, but I, I mean, I'm now looking to new ways third ways alternative well, well it no, just it just, just so, so happens <laughs> that we might I we couldn't might, guess we might have that right in front of us now okay. so so the, that's one of the and i, w I want to just for a moment hold on that okay yeah. because i want to just just kind of finish the thought process a bit sure. on if a when we look at some of the you know still where we do see this this change at least in design it seems to be that people, and this does apply somewhat to the perimplantitis discussion, is roughness and what mm -hmm. is the correct roughness and mm -hmm. what is the, you know, but we wonder if you could speak to the idea that we seem to see that, you know, connections, it almost seems like there is maybe an inverse correlation between the quality of the connection and the more polished uh, surfaces that we see. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, are we trying to account for what may be bone loss that's going to happen by saying, well, we need to create a surface that's cleansable because it's going to happen. Is there, mm. is there anything to that or is this something that maybe we're just reading wrong? Well, I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. And, and just to take a step back from that a second, you know, you, you say, what can the young learn today? We've been around. The truth of the matter is that Implant dentistry is an evolved science over the last certainly 30 to 40 years. If you separate out the original Branamark epoch, for want of a better term, and you know, the past informs a great deal about why we are where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so, to your point, John, you know, 
we, we've been through the so-called hybrid design implants in the past. Mm -hmm. And I can't help sit there I I listening to these lectures and looking at these slides and ask myself, you know, have I missed a trick here? Because we already did this <laughs> and we saw it didn't work. So why are we revisiting it? I mean, one thing that really struck me in uh, this afternoon session was uh, the debate that was presented to us about the idea of using a tissue level design implant in a submerged bone level way. Mm. Hamley published a study on that in 1996 and showed categorically that you always ultimately lost bone down to the rough surface. Now we're being told, look at these beautiful x-rays, we don't lose bone around this polished collar. So I'm kind of curious, What's changed about machine titanium today that wasn't true in 1996? I don't know what I'm missing here, but I'm missing something. It's yeah. very frustrating because so many people have recency bias and mm. they have a short-term memory of what, you know, we really have already well we saw this with composite bonding and i won't go down this <laughs> this rabbit hole too far but you know uh, one of our favorites harold hyman you know when we yeah. interviewed him about we said okay so let's talk about the generations of adhesives for instance Love it. Mm -hmm. and he said it was just old wine and new bottles it's the same idea right it's, yeah and in fact it's gotten worse as yeah. we've gone up in generations you know the fourth generation is still the gold standard for instance in bonding but there's just this need to to do something that seems so there's the to, to my earlier point, John, that's exactly what we're seeing. Design for design's sake. It's reinventing the wheel because we aren't having an airbag moment right. in implant design, you know, and they don't come along often, okay? They really don't. Not in the car industry, not in our industry. They don't come along very often, but by God, are we desperately due for one. We're ready. Yes. We're ready, but... So, so let's talk about the third way or the th or a different way yeah. to change the thought process. And yeah. we, we think you might be talking about bone glue, maybe. Are we on to something with that? that? That's one possible thing. Okay, okay. okay. So we've been seeing some publications, right? And most recently, even uh, Michael Picos published in IJBRD mm -hmm. just, just last month, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, on a, a three-year human follow-up. Mm -hmm. uh, the with first. The, yeah, the first three-year follow-up mm -hmm. on this showing... Uh, We've got the study up because we wanted, we were talking about mineral or organic resorbable bone adhesive, MORBA, mm. Mm. right? So we know you've been involved in some of the basic science with this as yeah. well as some of the development. So yeah. for the listeners who don't have any idea what we're talking about, because there will be many, mm -hmm. uh, what is that? Okay, so let's take a step back and first of all, put it into context. There's a million bone materials out here, okay? Uh, there's a million bone cements. Polymethyl methacrylate is a commonly used cement to fill in a void around a hip implant, for example. We all know this. Bone cements, whether it's PMMA or calcium sulfate or any other one of these, the vast majority of them are exactly what they say. They are cements or they are fillers. They don't possess an actual adhesive property like gluing bone together. Nobody's ever had their bones glued together when they break their leg. They have plates, they have screws. My son just broke his ankle in three places. He has plates and screws. So the mineral organic bone adhesives basically are a new um, category of material with no uh, precedent. Uh, to date. Um, they're all derived, the ones that are currently being developed, are all derived from um, the uh, marine biology. We all know that mussels and sandcastle worms and all these animals stick tenaciously to, uh, you know, the hulls of ships whilst they're submerged in water. If you take your finger and you put a bit of super glue on it and you stick it in, in a glass of water, it's not gonna stick. And yet we all know super glue is an incredibly strong glue. Uh, but wet environments 
do rather interfere with adhesion. So what these uh, people have done is they've worked out how these marine animals create a, 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 an adhesive that works in a wet environment. Um, and the mineral, mineral organic uh, bone adhesives are truly, truly adhesive. They are glues. I mean, when you stick two bits of bone together with this stuff, you can't break it. it it's unbelievable. Mm. More importantly than that, <coughs> though, they are... Uh, um, osteopromotive so we can't call them osteoinductive or even osteoconductive they seem to have a different process uh, the way in which they stimulate uh, bone formation angiogenesis and so on and it all revolves around one amino acid called um, phosphoserine and what we're starting to learn with phosphoserine <coughs> is that it almost has as much potency as BMP2. I mean, mm, it, mm. It, it really has an impact on bone. Mm. So these glues are resorbable. They are replaced by bone. And it will be in the not very distant future, I am sure, that these products will become a commercial reality mm. and instead of getting plates and screws people will be having their bones stuck together and instead of osteoporotic elderly ladies having to have toxic exothermic methyl methacrylate pumped into their femurs to hold their hip implants in place they will have glue and mm. that glue will actually convert to bone and it's really a very exciting... Now that sounds uh, it, like an airbag moment. It's definitely <coughs> got the potential yes. to be an airbag moment. I think primary stability is what a lot of implant innovators have tried to... Really, they've changed their thread design to try mm. to get... So we can do something mm. immediately or quicker, mm. right? The whole goal is to give people teeth, uh, mm. whether it be in two weeks when our crown gets back from the lab or... Uh, maybe but we'll yeah, but maybe then we we'll see these reports where yeah. you know we're we're seeing these 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 studies, basically these case reports coming out of an implant with zero stability, zero mm. ISQ or torque. Mm. We can inject potentially this material around them, and within ten minutes, I believe, is or something along mm -hmm. those lines, we have complete stability. stability. Uh, I could uh, well, you'll see in the study. I mean, it's published this month in Jomi. You'll see the ISQ graphs, and 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 the the key bit of the graph actually is is the first two readings because they're taken fifteen minutes apart, and you will typically take. I, I mean we were using very unstable implants in the study. So these are implants with often less than 50 ISQ. And they'll go from 50 or 45, and 15 minutes later, they'll be 75. Wow. Right? Unbelievable. I mean, it, That's it, unbelievable. It, that, that on its own is a kind of a proof of principle that you can manipulate stability a third way. That so, in itself could change implant design. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, and, and we haven't even started with right. that, Wes. I mean, you know, maybe there'll be an implant design that gets the best out of the glue. That's right. Right. Uh, but we so haven't we'll even, change that we, material. We, we haven't even started haven't even with that. No, well, maybe no, no, what, no. Let's, let's start with what we did see, which there were, not everyone was a success. No. But the comment, I believe, that was made in this study was we learned a lot. Yes. About how to manage this and how to handle the material through this. So speak to that since this was your investigation on well, how, what did you learn? And well, I think, you know, for me, it was also a, a, a really fantastic experience. One, one of the problems in our field is, you know, implant dentistry is replete with research, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much research published but actually when you look a lot of that research it isn't sort of first in human clinical trial pharmacological type level research the fda have actually categorized these materials as being um Com combination so they're not medical devices they're medical with pharmacological so that, of course, puts the burden of uh, scientific uh, rigor mm -hmm. on a much higher 
level playing field than we're used to having in dental implants which are basically medical devices and so the rigor is much lower. So for me to be involved in uh, that kind of a first in human clinical trial was a first for me uh, and having to deal with the regulatory authorities on a product that is now a combination product and not just a medical device was a, <laughs> a real eye-opener. Um, so you have to read that study in that context. Mm. This is not just a another medical device. This is something with potentially some kind of true uh, sort of biological uh, impact, like BMP. Yes. And there's a learning. It's a first in human clinical trial. And the problem is that the 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 assumption that you know you can translate from the animal to the human and we had the most incredible animal data actually published by Dave Cochran, yes, uh, another one of our past presidents here and you know his research was <laughs> mind-blowingly good that the, the histology was just it took your breath away and yet when we took it into the human we found it wasn't quite so straightforward mm. and there were three centers uh, for the first in human clinical trials. You alluded to one, Mike Picos here uh, and Dave Cochran's group uh, was another and mine in the UK but my, my protocol was slightly different because I felt that if you really wanted to really prove this product did something, you had to put a prosthesis on the implant straight away. <laughs> of course you did. Right? <laughs> Naturally. You, yeah, I mean, right? Does that surprise you? <laughs> Not in the right. least. So, you know, uh, Picos and Cochrane's groups, they, 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 they weren't immediately temporizing or loading their implants. And clearly the challenge was potentially a challenge too far or maybe the material needed modification. Indeed, we came to that conclusion. The, the protocol that we established for use in humans was established based on what we'd done in the animal model, but actually we realized that there were some aspects to our protocol that were harming the glue itself, harming the bond between the glue and the implant. So we sought uh, a uh, a request from the uh, regulatory th authority in the UK to remove those steps from the protocol. And as soon as we started to remove certain steps, and as soon as we started to have a better understanding of handling properties, of setting times, and so on and so forth, we suddenly saw a huge change. So in that study, uh, the overall success for it rate, I think, was 71.5%. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but actually, if you look at the success rate after amendment changes, the success rate was 87.5% success mm -hmm. just by learning. Yeah. Right? That's what a first in human clinical trial is all about. Of course. So I don't see a 71% success rate as a failure or something to be ashamed of. Uh, on the contrary, I think the study absolutely proved the potential for this material. And now we have to work on making it so that you can take an unstable implant and give that implant the same success rate as a stable implant, but without having to go through you know, aggressive threads, radial outward compression, mm -hmm. bone yep. fracture, and resorption, you and know, all the rest of it. I love Mark Ludlow's presentation today, and he was so vulnerable to show those things. And wouldn't it have been nice to have some of this bone glue <laughs> well, in the, that situation? You can let your mind sort of run wild with the possibilities. Like you say, I mean, you start to think about how this could affect many, many, many things. And But I think just, as you said, just the iterative changes as you learn and you learn and you learn, we're just excited to see where this takes us because, you know, we're, as you say, well, that using BMP mm. was interesting to me. To um, the, the problem with BMP is the cost. You know, we, we brought that mm. to the chair side. I brought it to, to, to mm -hmm. implement. You did too with some of the surgeons yep. we work with. It's incredible. I remember telling my dad, who's an engineer, I'm like, dad, literally we can grow bone just about on anything. Mm. And I showed him like some, some surgical pictures and then CTs afterwards. And he was like, this is incredible. 
I mean, he walked in and he told mom, he's like, Wes has grown bone. And I was like, well, I'm not. Just this material is. But it's, it's pretty special. Mm. BMP is, it's hard to use it because of the cost. That was one reason, yeah. And so sometimes the you know the idea of you're, when you're dealing with biological and pharmacological type of materials, it's very different. And so I'm sure you're getting to be exposed to some new thought processes. But yeah, them. but I think also with BMP, it didn't always deliver in the human in the same way it did in the in, it, in the exactly animal. Exactly right, studies. because there were cases where right? we used it and we were like, oh, mm. that doesn't look. That didn't look like And for what you were spending, you wanted oh. a better result than oh, that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And hence, it, it left. It so left what's the next step with that? What's the next step with that material? Well, I think you, you, you have to look at the glue in a much wider context. Dental is really just a very, very tiny mm. speck of a, a, <laughs> yeah. a, a side. It, it's, it's, almo a, it's, almost, it's almost a bit of a digression from its true value, which yeah. is in fracture we fixation. talked about that. Can you imagine what it could do? Uh, yeah. Oh, it's huge. I mean, it goes beyond what even you might imagine because um, they've also done sort of proof of principle studies for things like vertebral fusion. Mm. So you can actually just squirt the stuff between vertebrae and, you know, a year later, it's one solid block of and bone. And not have to put um, cages in. And not have to put cages. You can make wow. a more aqueous form of the glue and potentially inject it into osteoporotic bone can to you? increase the density of bone. NASA has taken the glue to the space station twice already because they're so interested in the potential it might have for astronauts on their way to mm. Mars or whatever because you can inject it percutaneously mm. to stabilize a fracture. An astronaut could do that themselves. Think about X-tip, but with bone <laughs> glue. I mean, seriously. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's a... Unbelievable. It, it's a really... It's probably... It, it's not probably, it is undoubtedly the most exciting thing I, I've ever been uh, involved with other than the launch of the AstroTech implant in 1990. Well, we're not yeah. bored anymore. So, yeah, that's right. No, no. We've, uh, and so this is why one of the reasons we knew, we knew we'd be speaking about this because when we saw that, we could just tell it. This is, could be uh, one of the biggest things that has happened. Yeah, I think it's important to temper the enthusiasm sure. and let people know that, you know, this is not a commercial product. We're not anywhere near that stage yet. Uh, and there's still wrinkles to iron out, but the proof of principle has already been shown. Mm -hmm. It definitely does what it says on the tin. It's very, very adhesive to bone. It's very adhesive to metal. It'll stick the two together. It'll stick bone to bone together, uh, and it'll do it in a wet, bleeding environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of that's now proven. Now we've got to make it so that it's highly predictable, mm -hmm. so that we get the same outcome time after time, and we don't find ourselves in a situation where 30% of the time it doesn't work. Right. Right. Uh, right. And that's where we're at. Amazing. Well, I think that, uh, you know, as we expected, we would, we would have a good time with this conversation. Definitely have. I think if you've not read the, the research, you know, now's the time. You're probably frantically searching PubMed for, uh, for information about this because it is exciting. It's mm -hmm. exciting when we get to, to, to see the, the progress of, of what we can do. I tell you what's also exciting, actually, for the dental profession is to have got there before the orthopedic profession. Mm -hmm that we are always now going to be the profession that brought this into PubMed. Now, that's pretty special. <laughs> it's right? pretty crazy to think. And, and for me to be one of those authors, yeah, I mean, it's a big deal for me. Yeah. At least that's how I see it. Anyway. I think it's a big deal. Congratulations. And, yeah. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to we're just We're looking forward following to hearing that. more about it and, and studying more about it. It has such Thank a you. cool commercial name. Can we say that? Yeah, I think we can say it. Yeah, yeah. we can say it. This isn't the BBC, is it? No. Uh, no. no, we're not. This You're not no. Clarkson, thank God, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. you know, if you know Superman, you know about kryptonite and how it hurt Superman. Yeah. This is not kryptonite. This is is tetranite. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, that's, I don't know that you could have finished the show any better than, than with that comment there. So 
Dr. Norton, thanks for being with us once Maybe again. Maybe you should call me Clark Kent. <laughs> oh, any day. Any My day. son is Clark. <laughs> oh, perfect. There That's even go. more perfect. Even better. Well, if you've listened to this and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed what, uh, you know, we'd like you to just uh, share what you've learned today. You know, share this video. Uh, give it your likes. Subscribe as well. Check out osteo.org and the AO's uh, social media as well. We're going to continue to bring you great content from the AO 2024. So for Mike Norton, I'm John Rogers and Wes Mullen and we are the dental guys all right john we're back whoa what an yeah. interview whoa is right whoa is right i mean you <laughs> what you is put this? this guy in front of a mic in front of a camera you know that he's not just going to to just say you know he's going to say what else, what's on his mind but he's not satisfied he's bored he's not satisfied he's bored, john he, yeah he has gotten to a point where he's saying what do we really What's really changing? What's mm. really challenging us? What's next? There's a lot of companies, and we saw this at AO, that were, now I'm not saying it's bad to look at what you can innovate, but in some ways, Wes, it was a lot of maybe thinking in some ways going back to things that we had already seen before, mm -hmm. maybe changing the names of some things, maybe looking at ways to, but in some ways it wasn't really necessarily Something we went, oh, well, that's completely different. But John, but this company, we heard man, that from he's, Mike Norton, this is this is a big change. This, this is, is a big, big thought deal. process change. This is a really big deal. I and mean, he he has, uh, along uh, with other thought leaders and researchers in the industry that we interviewed uh, on the show, you guys need to check out um, Rev Bio. Um, they're not a show mm -hmm. sponsor, uh, but um, Rev Bio, man, Tetranite. Um, is um, transforming bone repair, as their website says, as you're seeing on the screen. If you're on YouTube, check it out, uh, revbio.com. Yep. I love it. Um, you know, this could, I mean, come on, man. Who comes up with the idea? Now, we talked to Dr. Norton, like, in the hotel or something about, like, how this all became to be, but inspired by marine animals... The sandcastle worm. I mean, this is like true dream stuff, like Disney, yep. you know, and yep. it's elegant chemistry. You know, we're talking about, yep. John, we're talking about worm spit here, you know? Yeah, we're <laughs> talking about something that you have to think way outside the box to even begin to imagine how these types, and that is what has resulted in some of the most exciting discoveries in science Incredible. at the time is things that, you might not even consider. So, I has gotten, if it didn't get you thinking, you, you didn't listen to the interview. I think it's going to get you thinking what's coming with this. How will this change mm -hmm. implant designs? I guarantee you there's a lot of companies looking at this right now going, oh, man, what do we do if this becomes reality? So, keep your eyes open yeah, to what's coming next. Even recently, I've seen more stuff being published. And so, I really think that we're going to keep we're going to keep our ear to the ground, as my dad would say, <laughs> That's right. on this issue, because I think for you guys that are listening to this, how is this going to change dentistry? We thought after this interview that this is like some kind of far off, far fetched thing. Right. I think it's closer than we think. Yep. John, I yep. really do. I think there's, they're, they're further along than I think we are, they are. They're already making changes to the formulation of this product. It's a fantastic thing. The FDA has been working with them closely. And so, hey, this has been a great show, John. Um, if you're listening to this, oh, man, bringing in the music hot. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to this, I need you to text us, 865 544-8954. We appreciate your text. We appreciate the love we've been getting on Instagram, Facebook. It's all there for you and your enjoyment. The Dental Guys are back in a couple weeks for another episode, and we're super excited for that. Stay tuned. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And so for John, I'm Wes, and we are The Dental Guys.